Welcome to a new episode of the Cartridge Club, where we discuss our game of the month with members of our Cartridge Club community. This month on the show, we talk about the Nintendo 64 slash Rare Studios classic, Banjo-Kazooie. And who better to talk about the Nintendo 64 classic than me, yours truly, the Nintendo 64 superfan himself, it's Rocket Sauce. Joining me on the show, we have community members Creep1337, aka Creepy Josh, Moonside Brando, Chase the Mad Gamer, and Top Spot 123 if you've played along, you can always share your own experiences in the forums at cartridgeclub.org or in our community's Discord or across social media by using the hashtag Cartridge Club. Before I start the show, on behalf of the entire Cartridge Club community, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our Patreon Club backers like Joe Boyce, Barry Don Mars, Christopher Rohr, Dean Lasagna, and Caleb J. Ross. To our backers and Patreon supporters, thank you. <laughs> I grew up with this game, so it's it has a special place in my heart. Um, it's not one that I've ever beat when I was younger. So it was kind of like a mission for me to take take it down. I think Ryan, you know, I had a, a little Twitter discussion about you know whether we were gonna take it down on Xbox or take it down on N64, and I I did choose to take it down on N64 because again of my my childhood is the childhood copy that I had with still my childhood save on it. So I, I started a new save, but uh, it was just kind of one of those revenge or vengeance takedowns. So I, I do really like the game. I think that there's a lot of charm to it. The music's great. The characters are entertaining. I think the level design is fun, even though some of it is annoying. But I think that's true for a lot of games. We'll go into it a little bit later, I'm sure, but just like level specifics about like which ones are, which levels are an annoying and, and which parts I think are almost unfair to a point that they can actually push people away from the game. And those are the parts that actually did start to change my opinion of the game late, late game. It doesn't change my, I think I still enjoy the game overall, but I think that the difficulty spike near the end of the game really can leave a sour taste in in your mouth especially if it's you know if you're, especially if you're playing on the original n64 it's not what i want to say like beginner friendly like most of the rest of the game is so so i've played the game for the first time since i was like free on a well legitimate n64 Totally legitimate, not an emulator. But in the past, I've played it on the 360, so this was kind of like a complete difference with like note collecting and stuff. I was shooting for a 100% run, including stop and swap. But with personal life stuff, that kind of didn't happen, so I'm still kind of like just... Anyway, the game is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm a big fan of collectathons, especially Rareware stuff, like alongside Conquerors and all them. But Banjo is like one of the first that I've actually gone and in-depthly completed 100%. And it's kind of started my love for like 3D platformers. So like SM64, Battle for Bikini Bottom is one of them that I play a lot. I agree with the difficulty spike. <laughs> Just playing through Rusty Bucket Bay was kind of a chore. Especially the engine room, which I really, really hate. It was like the one I tried to go on a no death run in this playthrough and <laughs> I died like seven times there, nowhere else, anywhere else. But I did, I didn't make it past Rusty Bucket Bay. I kind of just took a nap and was just like, no, I'm done. <laughs> so I got up to where I could. Regarding the series as a whole, I'd say this is one of my favorite games. I, I always say Banjo-Kazooie is one of my favorite series, but I've never really got into Tui and Nuts and Bolts because they seem completely different and off the path of what the original was. Which I hear Tui's great, but I like the collectathon kind of feel that Kazooie has. So it's just a lot more fun. There's a lot of stuff you can collect. It's, there's just, it's just really... I wouldn't say big, but it's just like the perfect kind of like beginner platformer for people. Well, this was my first time playing it because when I was a kid, we, all my friends went to PlayStation, so it, it would have been ridiculous to get an N64 so we couldn't trade games to play. So I chose to play it on Rare Replay 
for on the Xbox 360 and I have to say the swimming parts of the game were a little bit broken onto it I found I have to agree with Josh the levels did spike very quickly in certain points I found it a little bit difficult to make myself around like of trying to find the levels but I guess that was the thing back then because like I said I was new to the N64 I only got it maybe about 10 years ago so I didn't know nothing about like these searching around games like Mario 64 I only beat it like within the last 10 years so Banjo Kazooie I did play Nuts and Bolts uh, before I played this one which was a big mistake because that one really sucks in the series uh, <laughs> but overall I did enjoy Banjo Kazooie a lot more than what I expected I figured it was going to be like a Mario clone, but collecting all the honeycombs, the music notes, everything like that, it was just fun. They could have had a little bit more talking into it. And I did find some of the secret things that they put in to swap in through Banjo-Tooie that they have in the 360 version that they were going to try, I believe, in the N64 version they were going to try. So I did find a couple of those secret eggs that they had. But my overall impression of the game, I would have to say I would have to give it a thumbs up because I want to play it again. Even though I didn't get everything, I still want to go back and play everything. This is a game that I I played back when it was first released. I got it originally in like 98, 99. You know, back then you, you got fewer games. You didn't have so many responsibilities and all that. So I was able to spend the time to 100% it back on the, on the Nintendo 64. So this go around, I, I went ahead and wanted to try the Rare Replay version, the, the 360 version. I'd only really played about 10 minutes of it. And uh, I had just finished playing the Super Mario 3D All-Stars, and, and I finished Super Mario 64, and it was making me all nostalgic for the Nintendo 64 and for collectathons. And so I started playing it on my own before I knew it was going to be Game of the Month. I just happened to pick it up because of that's, that's how the timing was. I thought I was over collectathons for the most part. I kind of felt that these games were like a relic of the design district, the restrictions of the cartridge format, you know, having to reuse the level space over and over just to find different things because they couldn't fit a lot of room for, you know, 20, 30, 40 levels. So they have to do everything in just like 10 or, you know, eight, whatever. But going back and play it again, I, I really changed my mind. I, I still really, really liked the game. I thought I had beat it back in the day and I'd never have to play it again. And I was good. Uh, even though I played the others in the series too, I didn't see myself going back into it, but I just picking it back up out of the blue, you know, 20 years later, I found it to still be a very good quality game, very well put together. It has some problems that we'll talk about, but uh, ultimately I, I had a good time playing it. Yeah. As for myself, like Josh brought up, me and him were talking about this earlier. It was kind of a revenge game for me. I've told the story a couple of times, but uh, it was one of those games that I bought probably right after it came out for the N64. Uh, I want to say maybe it was one of the few, free, first few games I actually paid with with my own money. But it was one of those games that I was really enjoying, and I got, got to a point with um, Click Clock Woods. I got to that point. I thought I did the majority of it, and I, I was always like either one music note away from getting to that mm. the lair. And I was like, ah, it's just one of those things where I, I didn't know where to go. I didn't have a guide. And this prior, prior to, I didn't have the internet for the longest time either until I was probably way into high school. So there was no like game facts for me to go to and consult and where I can go and get something to help me advance to finish this game. So I let a friend borrow it because I was just stuck at one point. I'm like, I'll, I'll come back to this later. I let him borrow it. And uh, I never got it back. He beat the oh. game. He beat the game. He showed me like the plane, but he was still like working on it or something. I don't know. It's one of those things. And I just never saw the guy again. So it happens. I know I've borrowed controllers or something from somebody and it's in my possession now because you just, it's something happens. Right. But it was one of those things where it's always been, you know, like a thorn in my side. Anytime I see Benji, because I'm like, Oh, that was a great time. I should really beat that game. I should really go back and beat that game. And now thanks to the cartridge club, here's my opportunity to go back and beat it. I did forget about the difficulty spike, especially with Rusty Bucket Bay uh, and how much of a pain that was. I didn't plan to 100% beat this game, and it, it ultimately came close. I, I know, I think, I know, I, I'm not 100% on this, um, so forgive me for this, but at the end of the game, there's always, um, there's a couple of things where 
and I don't know if this was part of Banjo Tooie or maybe it's part of the Xbox release, but there's Mumbo tells you a couple things you can go back for. Like, and I saw it in the game. There's one in the Freezy Peak where in the igloo you could see a key in Ice Key. Ice Key, yeah. I don't know. Is that a, achievable to go back and get by chance? Anyone know? It's, I don't think it's so. all achievable. Um, you just have to put in a whole bunch of codes in the Treasure Trove Cove right. little yeah, area. They were, they were originally um, that's going how... to set up a, a thing where you could swap the cartridges in the Nintendo 64 from one game to the other. Mm -hmm. And if you did it within a certain time window, certain register entries stayed in the RAM. But uh, the they internally changed some of the components of the Nintendo, the Nintendo 64 over time, so they had to abandon that plan it wouldn't have worked on all the consoles anymore mm -hmm. so they kind of yeah dropped that was it until the 360 release yeah that was the uh, secret egg i was talking about earlier mm -hmm. right so i i didn't know if that was achievable i i got i'm pretty sure i got everything in this time too i think i can only get the 900 music notes and um all the the puzzle pieces which there's only i think in my impression i didn't think compared to like all right, for me to compare this to, let's say, a Mario 64, where you really just only need 60 stars to get to the final Bowser battle out of 120, right? Is it 60 or is it 60? I think it's 70. 70? 70. 70. So you don't need to get 120 stars to beat this game. This one you need to get within two of the puzzle pieces before you can play Contilda. <laughs> yeah, there's two extras. So, yeah, that was, that was a little bit different for me um i was expecting it to be a little bit lighter so i know from my original experience i would still have to do a little bit more work to get to where i needed to go to but i was close i was close yeah so this time through i i guess 100 percent it as best i could i was using a guide for all the way through because over times you find guides at half price books or whatever hmm. you know and you snag them up so i've had this guide for that time that i ever came back to it and bam here i am i beat the game I enjoy the game and I will agree that the difficulty spike is there for controls. I will say to the part I had, I died the most on and it, it happened a couple of times, mostly with water or even in the air, but um, I hate inverted controls. And um, I, I'm wondering if on the 360 version, do they give you the option of switching that? I didn't try. I was, I was accustomed to that already. So yeah. I kept it stock. Um, I played it the regular way so i didn't want to like cheat out the system mm -hmm. but i don't think there was a setting for it i'm not 100 percent sure i'll have to double check and then since that's from the 360 uh, it could have been affected by the overall system settings because there's inverted controls built into system settings and so i'm not sure uh what the answer would be to that well regardless i i hate that so um <laughs> i I, die, I died a lot in clanker's cavern and I died a lot in yeah, Rusty Bucket. Rusty way. Bucket. Yeah. yeah. Um, because of having to go into water and swimming. So it killed me a lot. Frustration was a little bit there. Not so much that it made me want to stop playing the game, but just the, the part where I'm like, Ugh. because we, we will talk about this now probably, is if you die in the game, you, you don't lose everything, but you definitely lose. Um, you have to definitely kind of restart your progress on the music notes for the level. Granted, you'll have as many you, as you do going to that level. So let's say you had 28. It's your top score. Yeah. Yeah. You have your top score. But when you get to that, you know, I guess 100%. I don't know. I'm just saying is basically you'll you'll have to do some backtracking. If you die without saving, does anyone know? Do you have to redo? Um, I should say without resaving. But let's say you use your three lives up uh, and you die. Do you have to redo all the puzzle pieces too or do you still have those i think you just keep your jiggies and your honeycombs but everything else you have to redo gotcha but music notes only go away in the n64 version i think you keep those in like the xbox version that sure. is correct and that's it's a great modern day concession so if anyone is trying to decide which version to play if you want it to be tougher in 64 if you want some more modern conveniences i'd say the 360 port quick repeat who who played on what again here I played on the Xbox oh. One slash 360. And same same with me, Chase. Um, N64. Uh, I also played at the N64. 
and I was also in original N64 myself. So uh, just a, can I just ask a question go for ahead. us who played on N64? Did you, you what controller did you use? There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of different controller options now, and I think they they all make a difference on your gameplay experience. So I personally played on the uh, the Hori gamepad uh, for N64. Lucky. And and I honestly don't think I could have done it with a regular controller, at least not with mine. Well, since I played on a totally legit N64, because <laughs> I, I don't own the cartridge anymore, <laughs> I actually use an Xbox One controller. So I kind of did both. I did <laughs> right. the you Xbox both and hybrid. Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I played on a classic N64 controller because I'm used to that, that thing. That thing yeah. feels, you know... For me, I know some people complain about the controller, but for me, it's second nature. I've, I've played on it for over 20 years now. so. And I'll go back up just a second from what you mentioned a minute ago. I streamed the first two levels from the Nintendo 64. So even though I beat the game on the 360, I did do the first two levels. At the very end of my stream, I got the last Jinjo in um, Treasure Trove Cove, and it spawned the Jiggy, and I died before I got the Jiggy. because It spawned in a place that was hard for me to get. And then, of course, all the notes were respawned, but then all the Jinjos were respawned again, too. So because I hadn't actually collected the Jiggy, all the Jinjos all across the level respawned. I would have had to have gone and, and collected them all again. That's unfortunate. Yeah, it was something. Yeah, N64 <laughs> I was, uh, was going to play it on the N64, but all my controllers suck until I get them modded. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like we said, basically, if you want hard mode N64, if you want, uh, I was jokingly saying baby mode, play on the Xbox, but modern hey, no. means really. No, it's, I, <laughs> uh, if, I, if, I was going to call it baby mode as well. If, if, well, if, I, if, I had already beat it on N64, so I figured I'd earned the right to play the the modern version. And that's really, for me, mostly it goes back to the whole revenge tour. I had to beat it on the thing that right. I was so close to beating it on. So went back to that. Mm. If it wasn't maybe an N64 game. Like if it was a PlayStation game or something like that, I would play on the most modern, frequent, frequent, you know, whatever ease of access one possible. But because of what it is, Revenge N64. and sixty four. I just want to bring up real quick that reason back for that is because the Cartridge Club community had a poll, and fifty two percent, fifty two point one percent said they played on the original N sixty four hardware, while forty seven point nine played on the Xbox remastered version. So just bringing it right back here, but uh, yeah. Just wanted to see what you you thought about that part here. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyone ever play any of the other games in the series for the Banjo series? Brandon, I know you mentioned briefly I that you... nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts, and I've played them all except nuts and bolts. Yeah, um... even even the Game Boy Advance games. Yeah, that one I hundred percented, and I haven't. I'm, I'm very far in Tui. Uh, I'm to the boss, but I haven't beat the boss yet or gotten close to hundred percent. So, gotcha. I watched speed runs on Tui, uh, but I've never played it. I, I've watched. Yeah. Go. Ahead. I've watched nope. people angrily review nuts and bolts. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the extent. I've never even like. Kind of, I've saw gameplay uh, of Grunty's Revenge, but that's it. I was just gonna say for Tui, I think I held off on playing it because I never finished Kazooie. I, I don't know 100% why, but I think that's the reason why I never really sat down and played Tui. And I never owned it until a couple of years ago. I found it for a couple of bucks at a yard sale. So I acquired it. I acquired it recently. So I never actually sat down and played Tui. So, and I was always anti Xbox. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, I never sat down and played um, Nuts and Bolts. Well, I've been holding off yep. restarting Tui until after this podcast. I didn't want my memories to get muddled between the two games. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nuts um, and Bolt is more for racing, time limit type things, blueprint finding, stuff like that, and building. So you have to be good at building things and stuff like that. If you don't have the right blueprints, it's harder to play. I was, I've was i been aware of all the games. I have um, Tui and Nuts and Bolts. I haven't, haven't played either of them. Uh, Tui, again, similar to Ryan, I didn't want to play Tui until I had finished Kazooie. I have kind of weird that way where i want to play all the games in the series even if it doesn't make sense to um <laughs> or uh, not necessary actually banjo tui i got from our very own uh, dean round two gaming uh when i was first into youtube and he was pretty new into youtube and he had a contest and i won and i won his copy of uh banjo tui so that's the copy i have in my collection but nice. i haven't played it yet sorry dean 
<laughs> Let me ask you guys, what do you think of that game over screen? Because yeah, you see it if you you save and quit. Uh, yeah. Uh, it gets a little bit of that British humor, which I thought was pretty funny, because it happens a couple of times. Even though it's a kid's game, you turn Gruntilda into, like, sexy Gruntilda, you know, uh, with the transformation of Tui. I said I'm surprised that they added, like, something like that in, especially for the N64. Mm -hmm. Like, for its time, adding in, like, if you died or a game over screen, it would add something in like that, which was something I'd never seen playing those games back then. Yeah, usually just like goes to the like, uh, start screen again, right? This one, yep. this one, this one, this uh, you know, really tries to you makes know, you feel bad. Makes yeah, you feel, feel bad. bad quitting. Quitting. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely a rareware thing, though, because there's a similar occurrence in DK64 where K rule just blows up DK Isle. <laughs> so just stop, stop quitting in a rare game. <laughs> yeah, you gotta sit and play until you're done. Well, that's what it made me feel like. Like I had to sit down and start playing again because, oh, well, she turned into the beautiful witch. Oh, I can't let that happen. <laughs> and then she goes like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> she does what, Ryan? Say that again? Uh, <laughs> you know, to back to replay here. That's, that's the <laughs> best impression this entire show. Oh, great. Uh, sexy Gruntilda, yeah. Sexy Gruntilda. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't planning on impersonating that one. So, so the story... For the game, it's very brief uh, compared to something like a Witcher 3, but it's basically Banjo and Kazooie are asleep, and your sister, I don't know, she wants to go somewhere, but she gets kidnapped by the Switch because she finds out she's not the prettiest in all the land. I think her, her cauldron tells her, you know, there's someone better than you, and it's Tui, so she goes to kidnap her, and from that point going forward, you're on your adventure. Nothing special with the story, but it's, it's I guess, it has a lot of charm with the, the British humor for the game. Did you guys like the story or, did, like, the comedy good for you? Because to me, I love the comedy of the game. It's, it's I guess, part of the charm for the game. What are you guys' thoughts on, on that? I think the comedy is what really holds the game together. I mean, the story is pretty bare bones uh, to, like, pretty much non-existent. It's, it's very much the... Here's your objective. Go. Like it's got as much story as a Mario game, essentially, right? Mm -hmm, so, much. but it has, I would, I would say, more humor in, in some aspects. Um, even when you're, you're running around in levels or in the hub world, you have Gruntilda popping up, like throwing insults at you, saying that you're not good enough, and you know, it, it, different ways to motivate you to keep to keep playing. You know, discouraging you from quitting. So. Yeah, as far as the story goes, non-existent, but the humor is definitely what holds the, holds the game together. I used to love Kazooie fighting with everybody that you met. If uh, they said <laughs> something wrong, Kazooie would like insult them right away and like give them like wanted the information right away. While Banjo was just like, okay. The chemistry between Bottles and Kazooie is phenomenal. I just love Damn. how Kazooie hates hates. I don't know what was a bird brain or something. Keeps calling Bottles names. Oh, it's glorious <laughs> it inspires my per personality today <laughs> that's what's wrong with you <laughs> yes <laughs> no i thought I, th I think the humor is really good too there's it's always tough to strike the balance between endearing and annoying but and i do think they they fall on the endearing side in that game i was gonna say you know what's weird is i've only played the opening of tui and they kill bottles right away right immediately beginning. yeah immediately which is he, he's a ghost then for the part which <laughs> rare does that too they kill wrinkly kong for uh donkey kong country 3 to, they just love no to way. kill their characters yeah well well to quote um kazooie in banjo tooie um bottles wasn't the favorite character anyway <laughs> so yeah but it, yeah. It, it was centered towards kids you think they wouldn't have like did that but then again <laughs> yeah i mean it's pretty graphic in too he just like straight out of the gate just destroyed him and Ooh. and his kids are there. Wow. His kids are there dealing with the fallout of their dad being gone. It's it's part of the comedy and a little bit of the British humor. I mean, I kind of included it in my my beat screen too because uh, at the very end of you beat the game when you're getting credits, they're all on an island, and there's a waitress come by and she's got two watermelons right by her chest and she's walking past you all. And the mumble, of course, then starts like horning up a little bit there too uh <laughs> but it's i mean he does that for gruntilda too sexy gruntilda <laughs> when uh she comes around but it's part of, I, I guess part of the british british comedy and 
I don't know. It works. It works for me. It works for the game. Cheek, cheeky and tongue in cheek. So yeah, for the uh, the teens playing the game as opposed to the children <laughs> playing the game. So you gotta Sweet. admit the the stuff we liked as kids. There, you watch it as an adult now. You giggle at the things that you didn't get back then. Sometimes, yes. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll admit some of this probably went past my head as a kid too playing it. So let's talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. levels. I know we mentioned a couple of them that we we hated. Uh, but uh, is there any ones we generally liked? I like all of them except for Rusty Bucket Bay. <laughs> I love all of them except for Rusty Bucket Bay. If it did not have the engine room, it would be, it, I would, perfect level. <laughs> no. I hate that thing. I would have to say Treasure Cove was my favorite. It's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm very much in line with Brando. I think I loved all of the, all the levels I have a, a special part, a special part in my uh, special place in my heart for Mumbo's Mountain, just because I think that's the one I played the most. Like I've restarted this game countless times, and I played those one over and over and over. I know where everything is in that level, and I can just kind of run through it. It's kind of like my comfort food level. So, yeah, Mumbo, the, Mumbo's Mountain is a, is a very good, basically like a first level. It's not the very first area of the game, but it's a very good first level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it sets the stage really well. I like Spiral Mountain. They reuse it in basically every game, so that's kind of neat to see how they change it up for each game. It's it's not really a big area of the game, but it's you know sets the stage well and gets you started. But I also like Treasure Trove Cove and Mumbles Mountain. Uh, when I was playing it, I was of two minds of being nostalgic for having played it over twenty years ago and surprised at what I could remember. But then some of the stages, I don't, I don't have any recollection of having been through those stages before. Uh, so I mostly remembered the early game and the late game, but some of the middle stuff, um, Mad Monster Mansion, it's good level. I like, I like it. There are some smart things in it. I had no recollection of ever having been there before. <laughs> it just didn't stick in my memory the same way that even uh, Clanker's Cavern did. Because when you first come face to face with Clanker. Uh, that set something off in me. Uh, he's, ter got... he's terrifying. Absolutely. And they make you come like straight to his face. And it's like in that era, you didn't see assets that large in a game. Like he's gigantic. <laughs> and uh, you didn't see things like that in any polygon game. Really? You didn't have that kind of a scope. So yeah, he totally, and it was very, very memorable. I, I kept track. I made a chart of my uh, times I spent in each level. The, in my first playthrough, I only spent an hour in Clanker's Cavern. Only an hour. Uh, and I still remember it, <laughs> you know, 22 years later. And I remembered him as soon as I went down to, uh, to face him. It's like, oh, my God, this is where that thing is. <laughs> he killed me the first time I went into there. I only had yeah. one bubble left. And when he started talking, oh, that no. was <laughs> Yeah, uh a little bit of the sonic effect sonic uh underwater effect with that level i i drowned a few times in that level because having to go to the bottom to um number one let him go by going through loosen, the um, loosen the chain loosen the right. chain and then um there is uh jiggy i believe down there or jinjo there's a jinjo down there jinjo. yeah so it's definitely me going there and then just not getting the air bubble from the fish missing yep. it multiple times because of the uh, inverted controls and, and the, the camera too the camera is kind of in a tight place down there and it's not that easy to yeah the camera wouldn't towards. wouldn't work with me at all i will say i've so i've replayed some of this game on the uh <laughs> rare replay collection because uh my son came down and one day and saw me playing it he's three years old so he sees all the bright colors and the bear and the bird and characters so he wants so i've i've been replaying it on rare replay just with him just to also have a bit of a comparison and the same thing with uh rusty bucket not rusty bucket uh clanker's cavern it's very hard in the n64 version to see the bubbles down at the bottom uh in order to gauge like if you're too far in front of it or too far behind it uh, at least for me i had uh, that depth perception pro problem on the n64 but once i was on the rare replay version i found that like it wasn't hard at all you could definitely tell like where you needed to be with you, it you could tell but it was harder to go because of the inverted controls yeah i did i didn't really have an issue with the inverted controls because i anytime i i like fly planes or something that's inverted for me anyway obviously not with uh 
Not with regular controls, but again, once you're flying or, or swimming and stuff, I do switch to invert because I'm a strange person. <laughs> um, but that's, again, one of the things that makes the two differences, the two games different. I found uh, what made the Xbox version a little bit easier is you could even see a lot further. You could see where stuff was. On 64 one, you could look across the map and you would you would barely see an asset over there. On the yeah, Xbox version, I could stand at one other level and I could see the music notes on the other side of the level. So I knew they were there. So it definitely cuts down a lot of the looking around. Um, well, I can, and I don't want to sell the, the Xbox version as just, like you said, being baby mode. Mm-hmm. But it's it's a little more like, you know, if you're busy and it, it makes you waste less time. Like all the tedious things about the original, maybe they wouldn't have done it that way. Maybe they, they needed to to get the game out. And now they've fixed them for the new version. I breezed through the Xbox 360 mm-hmm. version um, in like uh, 15 hours, and it was twice as long to get 100% on the Nintendo 64. And it wasn't just that it was easier, but you just had to redo things a lot less. Deaths weren't as punishing because uh, you didn't have to re- start from scratch to do some of the things. So I just, I find it to be like, I don't want to say better because the original is, is a classic for a reason. But it's just more respectful of your time and and doesn't make you redo tedious things for no reason, just to waste more time, basically. So it's like more condensed that way. Yeah, I I think I spent like seven minutes longer than I should have in Mad Monster Mansion in the church because like in the N64 version, when you're on top of the little uh, pews in the church, you can only see like a cross and then like where you're at right there to where there's the egg the music note and the egg so if you're looking across on the other pew it's just not there you can't see it right. so i'm sitting there like where are the other notes hmm. like <laughs> i'm missing two notes where are they go all the way back in there like near the end i'm like oh crap they're on the other side i just didn't collect them so yeah the the distance is kind of what what's really like the limitations with the n64 is kind of Makes the N64 version more poopier. I would um, say closer to obsolete. <laughs> hard mode. Uh, yeah. It could have been uh, planned, and they cut it short because of processing problems. Certainly. So. Certainly, we don't know. Yeah. yeah, And just the last point I'll make about the, the Xbox 360 version, like I said, I came to it because of the Mario 64 port which everybody, including myself, was excited to play it again. It had been years since I played it, and I wanted it, the HD version and stuff. And there was talk about it. Well, I mean, it's it's barely a port. They barely updated or changed anything. But on the Xbox 360 version of Banjo-Kazooie, that's a very good updated port. They, they uh, fixed the camera problems. They fixed some of the control. Well, some of the texture work. Uh, full widescreen mode. That port should get a lot more credit for doing a better job of a Nintendo 64 game port that even Mario, they didn't do anything with Mario 64. So I was really, uh, and I just didn't realize that game came out years ago. <laughs> and, uh, but just, I hadn't made an effort to play it until I wanted to play it because of that. If I want to say a location or a world that sticks out to me is probably free. Freezy. Is it freezy peak? Freezy. <laughs> Freeze easy, easy peak. Yeah, uh, that that one like to me sticks out for it being the most. I want to say maybe the most different with all the challenges. From like, like you have to <laughs> slide down the hill to get the uh, the jiggy out of the polar bear stomach. <laughs> uh, you know, like the worst of one where. And here's the thing: is I goofed, I died, and I thought I could still go back to it. There. You have to. There's a there's a time limit one where there's a a piece where the it's being frozen inside the tree at the top of the tree. Um, oh yes. Yeah, and I know I died. All of a sudden, here I am, like trying to like peck at it with Kazooie's jump peck attack. And I'm like, why isn't it breaking? And I completely forgot that you had to go through all that all again to break the the ice that's surrounding it. But that one sticks out the most to me for, for that reason alone. There's like the present gathering. There's the race where you have to do it twice. Once where it uh, really benefits you to go get the racing shoes for the yes. second race. That you And you do have to backtrack for that, I yes. believe, because you haven't yeah. gotten the shoes yet if you mm-hmm. go in that order. You have to finish Gobi's 
desert first, right? Groby's Valley first, and then go yeah, back? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. 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 One yeah. of the go only times I remember needing to backtrack. Gobi and Freeze Easy are basically played at the same time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what I did is that I went straight to Gobi to get the speed shoes, and then after that, I just didn't collect anything, and I went straight to Freeze Easy. So I can just do a straight 100% completion of that level before going into Gobi and finishing that. Right. You know, anything with ice or snow, I basically would switch. I don't know how much you guys you have you do this for, but I almost always run as Kazooie or walk as Kazooie in the game. Same. Uh, yeah. Almost because yeah. number one, she's faster, and two, like there's no traction issues with her. With her, like for for the snow levels, you're not slipping around. She's got you know her feet down as opposed to Banjo will slip a little bit or. So I don't know. I almost the entire time when I restart a game and I'm in that hub world of Gratinola's lair, I'm always instantly flipping the Kazooie and running around and jumping throughout yep. the whole throughout the whole gameplay for for me. Um, I, unless it's like a nervous, like tight level, like bridge area, like in um, uh, the, the swamp room. level, the bubble oh, the bubble yeah. swamp. Yeah, because there's like a couple parts where it's it it's narrow and it's got like a zigzag pattern. Where I'm like, I'm not kazooie in this part up here i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> take my time with banjo but uh yeah so it's it's just what's called um i don't know that's that one sticks out to me a lot for, for this game speaking of levels they all have their own kind of unique track is there a level or a track that sticks out to you that you, you like because the music to me is fantastic in this game grant kirkhope knocks it out of the park and thanks to him for liking a bunch of the Cartridge Club tweets this <laughs> right. month. So thanks, Grant. Shout out to you here. Does anyone have any tracks that stick out to them for this game? Well, I, I'll uh, jump in on that. Um, you mentioned Freeze Easy Peak. Uh, all the music's good, but the music in that level was like very majestic. I really, really liked the music in Freeze Easy Peak. And then for one I didn't care for is Rusty Bucket Bay. Yeah, Rusty Bucket Bay seemed a little bit more like too carnival. Cartoony cartoony yeah in a bad um, way not in a good way not in a good way yeah i agree i'll i'll uh, i'll second top spot there i think freeze easy peak is up there with my favorites and i'm gonna go back to my favorite uh mumbo's mountain there i think it's just a classic again probably just because i heard it a bunch as a kid yeah. the one thing i do want to i do want to mention about the music is that it is dynamic it's not the music doesn't stay the same throughout the entire level uh there are little subsections within levels so as you move through them the music just like slides into like different instruments and stuff. It's it's still the same music, but different tones, different reverbs, different instruments, all that kind of stuff. And it sounds really good. So the dynamic kind of aspect is kind of why I would lean more towards Gruntilda's Layers theme as like my favorite track because true it transitions to like the different settings and levels that I mean my personal favorite was Freeze Easy Peak if I were to say a standalone track for the same reasons that it sounds more majestic and adventure like also I just really like snowy like icy themed levels I hate playing them but I like the <laughs> theme of them but yeah Gruntilda's Lair because it keeps like when you're playing the game it's not the same song over and over again it's the same melody but it's like with different settings throughout the game good point I would have to say I would have to say Freezy Peak would be my favorite. And every now and then I would hear a song and I would automatically think Teddy Bear Picnic or something. <laughs> uh, I think it's where you see the like the witch picture. I think that's where you hear the music and I would automatically start singing like the Teddy Bear Picnic song going in. <laughs> for myself I'll I'll say, you know, boring Spiral Mountain. It's it's one of the most memorable tracks for me when you fire up the game. It's comfort food. It's a fantastic song. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll mention about the way the music's used in this game too that stood out to me at least on this playthrough is how it changes and I, I know other games probably do this one but it really stood out to me how the track how the music changes differently like in water true how you can hear uh, Clanker's, Clanker's Cabin does it like the even at different levels like as soon as you go under the water a little bit it changes and you go way down to the deepest it changes again and it's really it's subdued now. yeah yeah and I thought that was just really neat, especially for a game of its time, over probably 20 years old at this point, to do that, something like that. And like I said, I imagine other games probably have done it, but to me, it really like stood out to me when I'm playing it. I'm like, wow, this is... I mean, it happens in Spiral Mountain when you jump in the water to get... I think there's a, a Jiggy that's in the water or something like that, because they definitely want you... They definitely do like a little bit of a training course in that level. So there's, there's stuff like that. And I noticed it also in... Uh, Clank, 
Clinker's Cavern as well when I was in the water, going deeper than the water for that part for for having to do the parts that you have to do in there. So I just thought the music was perfectly executed throughout the whole game and little effects like that really stood out to me. So what are you guys' overall thoughts on the gameplay for this game? Well, um, going back to when it first came out, it just seemed like a bigger and in some ways better version of Mario 64. That's how I had categorized it in my head. I mean, it's it's built off a lot of the same mechanics, uh, collect-a-thon mechanics. You know, Mario 64 has the red coins, but Banjo-Kazooie has the Genjos. A lot of it's very, very similar. But in the years since I first played it, my... Uh, my critical vocabulary has increased just because of YouTube essays and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite a different game. Mario is a lot more about like athleticism and, and control of your characters. But Banjo-Kazooie gives you just decent control for the most part all the time. So they've got to find other ways to challenge you uh, with, you know, with how, how many hits certain enemies might take and, and how they attack at you. And you're able to get in all kinds of areas in Banjo-Kazooie without a lot of problem that when I just got done playing Super Mario 64, even this year, like a lot of that was tedious to get to because of the control problems. And I think a, a level that really shines out in Banjo-Kazooie would be Freeze Easy Peak. There's a giant snowman level in Super Mario 64, and your goal is to maneuver your way to the top. That's one of the places where the stars are. But Banjo Kazooie says, no, nah, you can just fly. You can fly anywhere you want. <laughs> you know, we're not going to restrict you. We're just going to let you do what you need to do and explore the level and find everything you're looking for. You, you know, one thing that just kind of stood out to me here, too, is the transformations for this game. Because it, it makes me think, and maybe other maybe other um, games have done this. Most, most uh, recently, probably for me, is for 3D platformers, I should say, is probably Mario Odyssey. The transformation you throw you know the hat and mario becomes a dinosaur mm -hmm. or you know a frog or something like that but banjo kind of did this years ago i don't remember mario quite doing this for for his games is does anyone have any other examples maybe of other games doing something like this besides maybe tui i know tui has a lot more or well, I, does, I was does... reminded of odyssey much more than super mario 64 while i played mm -hmm. um you're given these little sandbox levels and just told to explore and figure out where to go and what to do. And each discrete, discrete corner has different things to do to earn your collectibles. It's a lot more like Mario Odyssey than it is like Super Mario 64, really. Not to mention the fact that you don't get booted out of the stage whenever you collect something. You know, sure. you just get to streamline and keep going forward. So I found it to be a lot like which, Odyssey. Which I like more than with Mario 64, where you got one star and got kicked out and you had to go back in, while with Banjo, you kept going type right. deal was a lot better anyone have a a favorite transformation the washing Crack machine that pops up rarely <laughs> it's <laughs> so, in Tui, but it pops up rarely in kazooie yeah it's like a small chance of it happening yeah mumbo messing up or something like that and he'll automatically change you back to something else yeah, yeah exactly i'm gonna say I, the, I the walrus probably for myself i i, <laughs> I kind of like the walrus i know you have to do a race with him as him but I, I think maybe the walrus might be my favorite transformation just i don't know i guess you don't have to worry about being burned by the water or something like that i mean I they're all kind of good though they all have their benefits I, I like the little crocodile guy except for the mini game you've got to play while you're him that that part kind of sucks but oh, just running around as him is is pretty fun he's pretty quick and yeah well the if mini game the mini game i found it was easier on the 360 to play it you yeah, can, it still wasn't good. <laughs> there, there, there's the speedy <laughs> shoes that you can uh, use to help the second race through. But even even then, it's like rubber band AI, so it's still yeah. a little bit harder. It's he cheats. ridiculous. He's a cheater. I hate him. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of the least favorite parts of the game. Humble brag, I beat him without the speedy shoes. So did I. Ooh, yeah. I'm a pro so did gamer. I. <laughs> pro gamer. I never, I never went back for the second time. I didn't think it was worth it. <gasps> I forgot. Uh, um, is that is that that's a junk, uh, that's a piece though a puzzle piece for that right? Uh, no, the second time is just like he's gonna give you life, like lives. three one ups, three one ups the, versus. But one. if you lose, he's gonna chomp you for he like takes an entire one. life, for like yeah. an entire whatever life, sure. whatever whatever it's called. I I got all the jiggies and I didn't have to do that part. So my favorite one is the uh, the the ant. I know I, I keep defaulting to Mumbo's Mountain here, but I think it's a termite. Okay, termite. What, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, said, I think it's an ant too. I don't know. It looks like an ant. Uh, 
It's got it's got six legs. Like, like, termites have more than six legs. I have no idea. <laughs> and either way, I just think uh, he looks really cute when he's wearing he's running around as a termite. He's got a little backpack. All the little all the little uh, other termites slash ants are saying, "Where'd you get that backpack? Give me that backpack." Or <laughs> those are cute shorts. I want those shorts. Give me those shorts. I think it, he jumps around and makes little like wee 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 sounds, and it's it counts it's to cool. the music. It counts to the music. Uh, He's also super useful in that level because there's a lot of hills, so you can just transform into termite and run around the entire level and collect pretty much everything you need. And you actually have to... The one thing that is different about uh, this game is sometimes you have to actually leave the game as your transformed figure in order to get the jiggies that are outside of the, the level that you pop when you hit the Gruntilda button inside the level. Mm -hmm. Then uh, And then there's also uh, Cheeto... That you sometimes have that you usually for two of the Cheetos, you have to be the transformed figure to find him or even to get to him. So I don't really know any other games that really let you do that. Usually, when you leave a level, they transform you back into your main character. Well, yeah. this one here, they up used it to get some things that were just outside the level. Yeah, you're on a, you're on a leash, but they give you a little bit of room there. And that, that yeah. ant one, that was the last one. I had missed that. So to get my 100%, <laughs> that, was the, that was the one I had missed. I had to go back and do that and get the one outside. So The pumpkin's very unique, too. Yeah. Uh, that one's very unique, but uh, makes going through the um, gutters in uh, the toilet, I believe, right? You have to go <laughs> yes. get flushed on the yeah. toilet in, the, in the, the horror level, which I thought was pretty funny. Because uh, even I think Gruntilda then comments right after it saying, like, I can't believe you did that. Well, yeah, it's, why are it's, you getting... it's something. Uh, but I hope rhyme, you wash your hands. I hope you wash your hands or something like that, right? Yeah. She oh. only speaks in rhymes, so I can't really speak right. her language. Mm -hmm. I like how most of the uh, it's it's all somewhat logic based, even if it's video game logic. You can just kind of they give you enough pieces, not puzzle pieces, <laughs> enough pieces to figure out what it is you're supposed to do, like telegraphing that. You know, the like the downspout, you know, well, I can't fit down that hole, but I can see it. That's gotta mean something. So that's how I found Cheeto outside the level because I saw the Gruntilda sister, Bruntilda, over there. So I went over there and then I saw a little hole behind her. And I was like, How do you Oh, oh. I gotta be a pumpkin? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> The, the only solutions I didn't like is they, they made up so many reasons for the eggs to work that don't really make logical sense, but they gave you the power and they needed you to use them. Like, you I don't mean know eggs what, don't clean teeth? What are you talking they about? They don't do that. They don't grow flowers. They don't <laughs> uh, uh, plug uh, holes in buckets. There's lots of things <laughs> eggs don't do. But uh, that was, you know, they're using their limited tool set. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was definitely unique with having to drain the water. You have to fill a bucket with, with egg. <laughs> and it makes a little fart noise when you because there's two different there's two different ways to shoot eggs you can shoot her out her front or she can shoot it out her back and the back way is yeah because you have to do it a couple of times like growing the flowers and that one i don't say it's challenging but it definitely is a lot easier to shoot the eggs going forward than it is um farting them out and having them bounce into a bucket bounce so, in, yeah yeah so the characters for the game uh, the main, the main two you play as you're both here with Banjo and Kazooie, but there's a couple other ones here too. Um, there's Momo Jumbo, who's a witch doctor. There's Tui, who's Banjo's sister and the person we're trying to rescue. There's Gruntilda, who is Gruntilda's sister, and you know, at first you maybe like do what I did and completely forgot until I <laughs> consulted my strategy guide and I started bringing it up then to others who are playing it in the Discord as well. She's the one who starts giving you trivia trivia knowledge for Gratilda. And at first, you probably don't think, hey, this is useful at all. But then when I started playing the strategy guide, or looking at the strategy guide, and I saw that there's a marked field for filling in all the answers. And I was like, what's this for? And then looked into it. There's a boss battle, a pre-boss battle with Gruntilda. It's a quiz show where there's questions that are pertaining to things you've seen in the game. There's like physical challenges. There's a Banjo Kazooie card, a Joker card. That's what it is. It's a Joker card that if you get correctly, you'll get a skip. You get two skip cards if you if you complete it correctly. And it could be any of these things. It can be 
any of those ones I previously listed, or it could be a Gruntilda question. And the answers for the Gruntilda questions are random per game. It's it's never the same questions per game. So there's several answers, several answers for the questions, and it's randomly generated for the game. It's never the same. And the only way to truly get the answers is to go talk to Brent, uh, Brentilda. And she's scattered all over the game. She gives you three answers per time. So it's encouraged that you write it down or take a picture, modern day taking a picture. And there's a couple of um, sudden death cards that I think would infuriate somebody that you get wrong, you're going to die and you have to do the whole board over again. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I I saw that there's no there's only one real way to cheat it. Like there's a couple of ways. I've, I've I've I looked this up. There's somebody who made a random generator where you can put in like the first word for the question. It will pop up the answer for for the question here. But not cheating and doing it legit here. Um, I I could see why someone wouldn't like this because honestly, if there probably wasn't a sudden death card, it it probably wouldn't be so bad. And it's the challenge, and Rare is known for their games not being the easiest. I mean, you look back at the Donkey Kong Country games on the Super Nintendo, there's some challenge to them, and, you know, Rare definitely I think wanted to get your money's worth, but I, what did you think of the, the board game, or the quiz game here? Well, I must have gotten incredibly lucky on my playthrough, because I breezed right through it, but it is one of my least part, favorite parts of the game, and they kept doing it. They even have it in ukulele. I was like, oh no. <laughs> but yeah, I must have gotten very, very lucky because I breezed right through it. Uh, Rare, they have a thing where they just don't want you to have any other game in your life while you're playing one of their games. <laughs> like you have to be devoted to it. Uh, so much so that even if you try to quit, they're going to tell you you did everything wrong and in, in, in the game. Yeah, I, I got to the uh, got to the, the board game part and Thanks to your tweets, I did realize I had to go back and talk to Brentilda. So I was trying to remember where everything, where she was every time, but I couldn't remember everything. But I did write down most of the stuff. The I got lucky. Uh, I did a couple of the instant death cards, uh, and I I did not die, thankfully. Um, but I could definitely understand that if I had died, it would have discouraged me from continuing. Uh, especially if it happened multiple times and it runs through your runs through your lives. Um, as well as the N64 version, I, I know we keep going back to it, but the but differences between the N64 and the Rare Replay version, if you quit and come back on the N64 version, you go back down to three lives, regardless of how many lives you've started with. That's true on the 360 as well. It is as well. Okay, I wasn't yeah, sure if they I were built knights. up to like nine lives, and then no, every time I started up again, you're back to three. Yeah, so I would, I have, when I got to the board game and I had nine lives. I'm like, well, I have to do this now. I can't quit and come back. Cause I'm going to have to go and collect all my nine lives again before I get back here. So I did want to go through it. Um, so this is just a heads up to anyone who might be listening and you haven't got to this point yet. Make sure that you get there with nine lives. Also, you can get more than nine lives. The counter just doesn't go past nine because there are other places you can die and then you lose a life, but the counter still stays at nine. But for some reason, I don't know 10 was just impossible. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a bit of a, a tone shift for the entire game. You're not ready for it at all. Um, those skip cards, I attempted three of them and I failed each one. Oh, and yeah, so uh, I got to a point where like, well, I could, I could try to you know go up here and get some other ones, but I got to pass instant deaths. But then I could use those skip cards for these ones, but I haven't had any luck getting skip cards, so. Is it worth it? I don't know. There's a lot of there's a bit of strategy going into it, kind of trying to pick your route. I would also say if anyone's going to play it, pull up a a picture of the the game board so at least you can kind of strategize which way you want to go, and not doing it just haphazardly. And I'll let you guys talk too. But another quick thing, like don't they're gonna they're gonna show you images from all throughout the game and ask you to identify it, and. <sighs> I it it's kind of fun. It was kind of neat, you know, but like don't take a break. Like don't go away from this game for a few months and then come back and try to do that because you're not going to remember all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It it'd be best if you were have played it, you know, fairly straight to finish recently. I'll I'll say with the board game too as I was looking into how to complete this board game. The far left side is the easiest way. It has the least amount of sudden death cards. It's the longest way. 
but it's also the easiest way to get through the board. I the way I beat it is I got to the Joker boards where I got um, so I had a total of four cards, and I saved them for that final final stretch because I know that I think there's at least two before you can get to the the board or to the top board. So when I got to it, and I know if I had one more, I could have probably skipped the final three. I had to do one sudden death card board without wasting my cards. Um, but after doing that, I just then cruise cruise through the the whole uh, board, final piece of the board without having to do any of the questions. I just used all four cards. Just get me through here so I don't have to worry about this here. And that's how I went about it. I went the far left way, got two cards, or two board Joker cards. So I had a total of four cards and then skipped the final four parts. So I kind of real quick want to go back to that um, statement about how when you had nine lives and you restart the game, you're back at three. That's because Rare does that for like all the other adventure games. Because you game over whenever you quit, so you go back to the lives that you started at. Yeah. Um, but as for the uh, board game, I didn't go past Click Clock in this playthrough, so my mind's a little fuzzy about it. But from what I remember, the last time playing it, I remember, well, hating the sudden death ones, but I never really talked to Bruntilda ever, so I would always just spam the first answer and pray to God that it works. <laughs> Um, but I personally, if, if there wasn't any, like, sudden death or any Gruntilda questions, I think the board game would be fun. I like kind of, like, going back to seeing, like, oh, what level's this? What music clip is this? Um, what's this character, what's this character's voice? Like, kind of, like, testing you to see, like, I think that's a really cool idea, but it's just, like, me, I don't really care about Gruntilda as a character or what Bruntilda has to say, so I'm not really like going out of my way to like talk to Bruntilda. Well, I wish it were optional then, because yeah. it, it I didn't I did have fun playing it, but I don't think it should be the thing standing between you and beating the game. Yeah, it should be something that you do in order to get like maybe an upgrade or something, uh, kind of optional. But some of the questions that I think that they ask were like a little bit unfair. Just again, in my opinion, they ask you to pay attention to certain things that you never would normally. One of the questions I got was, "How many chain links are in Clanker's chain?" Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yep. And who who is counting that? Uh, the other one I got, I'm sorry, I didn't get. I, I was looking through some of the questions, like the possible. I had I had to look up just a bit of a. I tried to cheat, but it, they give you so little time on the timer; it's hard yeah. to cheat. So afterwards, I was just kind of flipping through for fun. And one of the questions is how many molehills, like bottles molehills, are in a level? Again, who is counting this? So I think some of the questions are a little bit too. Uh, well, they were definitely future, picky. definitely future proofing it, so you couldn't just go on, you know, Google the answer basically. Yeah, exactly. They, they wanted to make sure that uh, there was actual challenge to this 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 board game here. Well, you could always go OK Google, and when it asked the question, see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have like Maybe. eight seconds. You have like eight seconds to, to get that in. So they they definitely don't give you the chance to to correctly do it. Like, like I said, I I was not able to find the speedrunner tool for the the um generated answers where you just type in the first word of the question and it automatically generates the answer. I was not able to find it. I looked. Believe me, I looked, but I ultimately did it legit. Yeah. But you know, the one thing about this game is it doesn't have many boss fights either. I don't know, it's almost, almost kind of like a Castlevania 2 esque kind of game where it's basically just go to the level and complete it and not worry about fighting a the boss. There's maybe two other ones besides Gruntilda I can think of, one being Nipper, the giant hermit crab, and um, a giant, I don't know what its name was, but it was a giant boombox. Boombox was I the crate, so. was the giant crate. Yeah. In, in the, um, I think so. Rusty Bucket Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, I wouldn't take the hermit crab as a boss fight, though. Just because it's large, um, it's That's just an I'm obstacle, it, really. Yeah. yeah. Cause, well, you gotta go inside it too to get the the piece after you smack them. Right? I feel like it fits like the Nintendo trope of like the three hits and you're dead. So I feel as though that it would register as a boss fight. Yep. That's why. Big, big and multiple hits. So your boss might not be registered. You might not need it to complete the level, but big three hits. Your boss. So would sorry just just by that based on the definition would the monkey then also be a boss? Could be 
Is it eight? You know, yeah, the ones throwing the yeah. throwing the oranges. Oranges, yeah. Yeah. Could be yeah, a first level I, boss. I never, I, I never thought about that, but yeah, the monkey probably would be. And he gives you multiple jiggies too, right? There's like th two. You have two. to get all the oranges on the ground around him. Then you have to steal the orange from him. Then you have to to give it to the, the little monkey, Chimpy, and then uh, then you got to hit him with the eggs, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like yeah. three jiggies right there. So, game doesn't have many bosses, but the final boss definitely is a challenge. But they give you they kind of give you the double twist there too before, because after you do the quiz show, you start seeing credits for the characters. Ultimately, had me start texting some people who I know beat the game. I'm like, did you just quit after the quiz show here? Because I'm seeing credits right here, and everyone showed me, nope, there's a uh, final, there's another final fight coming here, and you got to do it. And that one's that one's definitely challenging. There's definitely um, multiple waves to Gruntilda. There's at least, is it five waves? Five waves. Yeah. So if you, the reward for 100%ing it, or pretty damn close to beating the game, is um, at least with the music notes, there is one, I believe, that gives you, no, it's the puzzle pieces. I'm sorry, it's the puzzle pieces where you get an extra layer of health turns your honeycombs from yellow to red so it makes the boss fight a little bit easier not like much until, yeah not much <laughs> um and to me like maybe so much that i didn't die so much from getting hit so much in in that final battle i died because i fell off the front a ton most most likely the third wave which i believe is the one you have to shoot eggs at her she's mm -hmm. lobbing stuff to you in the the i guess the key to it is you want to get behind whatever the middle, middle pillar and wait for it to get done shooting and you want to get up jump and shoot eggs at her but after every time you do it it gets a little bit faster and faster and faster so i died a lot because one hit for some reason you don't jump backwards when you get hit that thing it pulls you forward forward yeah and yeah. i fell off so many times doing that i i know i died a few times in the fourth wave which is flying and you have to smack her in the air because of that but i died way more at that egg attack Anyone else? Well, it's can... a classic difficult. You got all those waves, and no matter how many waves you make it through, when you die, you start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And it just protracts the battle. So, yeah, it, it took several attempts. It took me a few times, too. And the credit thing reminded me of, like, Donkey Kong, where you beat the boss. That's true. And as the credits start rolling... He, he wakes back you, up. He gets back up, and you have, to, you have to hit him again. Which is another rare thing. Yeah, I forgot about that. There's a lot of rare similarities between like this one and Donkey Kong. Same with like the minimalist HUD design, right? Like you don't see any, you don't see your health on the screen, you don't see anything on screen unless you nope. like directly interact with it. So like you don't see your music notes until you pick one up, and you can see the number. Everything goes away. Similar to Donkey Kong. The Gruntilla fight at the end, I think, is pretty much that. That will either make you love or hate the game. It did take me a little bit out of it uh, mostly because it took me like three hours <laughs> to beat her same thing with uh, as you ryan i would jump up to the top of the the ledge of the castle edge there uh and shoot eggs i'd get hit and even though i was facing her you again you think the classic term knock back and uh you'd think it would throw you back towards the castle or away from where you're facing but uh no it just pulls you right off and uh, i think that's a little bit unfair because it goes against pretty much everything that the game has done up to that point. The shooting the eggs. I think also this is where a lot of the where the controls start to fall apart a little bit. It asks for a lot of precision. And again, Ryan, like kudos to you for doing that with a regular N64 controller because Pro gamer. <laughs> sure. <Get> good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um trying to trying to shoot eggs pretty much like Pin, with pinpoint accuracy to get up to where you need to be with your when you're shooting those eggs and trying to jump up top i always find myself i would jump and then i would try to crouch immediately because you have less and less time before she starts lobbing explosives at you mm -hmm. so by the time i would get up there and go to crouch i hadn't quite landed and yep. so i would do a, a ground a ground pound and, and then all the of a sudden you it have, takes yeah. the whole time out and i have yeah. to jump back down and wait for another cycle and that happened constantly it's a test I'm, of patience. It definitely is. You cannot rush anything. Uh, I, and I you want to fire off multiple eggs to try to get a few hits in, but later on, you really can't. You can only no. get one out, and you got to duck again. So Yeah. 
So it, it definitely forces you to take your time, mm -hmm. slow down, hit your hit one shot move. If you miss that shot, who cares? Move. Right. Um, th and the game is also depending on how many music notes you have. When you do die, it does kick you back out. Um, but if you have enough music notes, you can refill your eggs and your gold feathers, mm -hmm. which I think is a, one of the few, game's few concessions in the uh, in the boss fight. Uh, the one thing it wouldn't fill you up on is red feathers, which I found myself. No, it, uh, that's that's there. That's on the other side of the room, maybe. Mm -hmm. All three are there. Yep. Really? Because I did not see that. Then. Yeah, I okay. think you got to go the other way uh, to the other side of the the entry door, and they're over there. Uh, the okay, camera doesn't can... show you. It's yeah. a tra it's a follow cam, and you got to like make it go over to where they are. Okay, then I then I completely missed it because I had to leave and go and collect red feathers oh, and no, come back. Poor guy. Yeah, so I was just like, that's why it took I was about hours. to quit right there because I'm just like, this is ridiculous. You make me lose all of my supplies and you kick me back out and you don't refill the one thing I'm gonna need to 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 fly around. So I guess that's on me then. So I, I take that part back. I I did the same thing. I didn't know there was red feathers there. Yep, uh, and there's a. In the room prior, there's also a banjo trophy that gives you one life, too. So I, every time I died, I went back there first, got my trophy, then went back, refilled everything. Yeah. And then jumped in there. So again, it, it lets you, like, it doesn't, it, the game doesn't want to game give you a game over, right? Mm -hmm. It does let you. But you have to, earn, you have to earn the win, though. You have to earn the win. Yeah. I, I died. I, I can say I died also a bunch, not, not a bunch, but the flying part. I always flew past her and then over the edge, and I got, would press the wrong button to fly. And I would just go die straight to the ground. Oh. So you know, because they also you know you do that zoom attack, you zoom yeah. right past her, and then I'm over the edge, and I'm just like trying to fly, and I'm pressing the wrong button, and I just crash right to the ground. <laughs> so died a few times on that, but mostly the egg shooting her with the egg. Um, I also would like to point out that I I then resorted to seeing what some speedrunners do for this because that's what I do when I'm really frustrated to see how can they be the final boss. Go to, go to speed runs, and I saw that they were doing is as soon as you get her with whatever the four eggs, jump to Kazooie quickly. Go because you know where she's going next. She doesn't, you know, go different areas. She's gonna go to like whatever the right or something like that. So you just immediately go with Kazooie, go to the that middle pillar, jump up and start firing eggs, get the four shots, go to the next one, start firing the eggs right before she gets there. So, I mean, I tried doing that, but I still couldn't get there in time to get a shot out. <laughs> I mean, getting straight, getting lined up, that's also a part of a challenge, too. Yeah. So, you getting know, your that's... camera lined up, making you're sure you're facing the right way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, but... I hated that part altogether. I find it funny because since I didn't get there in this playthrough, I and I really didn't like the boss fight as a whole. So, it's not really a memorable boss fight. Mentioning the beak bust or the beak bomb and then like completely missing Gruntilda. And then, like, you just hit, like, the wall outside and just fall to your death. And that's, like, the one thing in my memory that just popped into my head. Because that's just what kept happening to me. To the point where I had to shut the game off for, like, days or weeks afterwards. Because I was just so done with it. Well, me, the, um, the game glitched and I went right through and hit that wall. Mm. Oh, I love it. Yikes. <laughs> The only thing I remembered, like, completely was the very end of the boss battle, which, you know, hopefully, if you've beaten the game, that's pretty much what you would remember for the most part. Yeah. But. Yeah, I mentioned I'm all, I'm on the Tui boss, and it's tough, and that's where I dropped it. I dropped it, whatever, 16 years ago. I haven't picked it up yet, because the final boss is just that tough on that game, too. At least, at least it is to me. <laughs> Does anyone... I know we, there's uh, Banjo Tooie and there's the nuts and bolts. Is there does anyone have any recommendations for I guess like what's the next ban best Banjo Kazooie game of you if you like this game a lot? What's the next one to play? Or is there any other similar games that you would recommend to people? I know, I mean, this falls into the whole 3D platformer world, but uh, most one I can I'll, I'll start it off right here. But with a recommendation is like I'm gonna say Conquer Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Uh, and I know it's mature. It's mature audiences alone. It, it definitely got the British humor. It's really over the top. But the one thing I, it stands out the most with Conquer here is I had an N64 promotional tape, and I, I know I probably still do. It's got to be somewhere in my parents' basement on VHS tape, which showed Conquer's, was it 12 Tales or 9 Tales or whatever it was supposed to be, his, his 3D platform game, which looked pretty damn similar to Banjo-Kazooie. So I was excited for that game. 
prior to becoming Bad Fur Day. I was excited and then it went off the map for like another two years and then eventually came back as Bad Fur Day. And I remember a couple of years ago reading this interview with, I, I think, the guy who was the voice of um, of Conquer. And he said they were working on Conquer's Bad Fur Day and there's a there's major competition over at Rare. So there was people working on Banjo Kazooie, there's people working on DK uh, DK64, there was their crew working on Conquer because they were supposed to make a franchise out of all the characters from the Diddy Kong Racing series. And that's where Banjo made his debut. That's where Conquer's at. Tip Top, who is in uh, what's called uh, Diddy Kong Racing, is also in this game. He's a uh, orchestra leader of these turtles. But they're all supposed to have this like little mini universe or their rare universe for their these characters in it. And back to Conquer, I should say it's like they got they said, well, we would just be copying Banjo Kazooie here and we'll be copying DK64. We, we're not doing anything different. Our game's going to fall in the shadows and no one's going to think anything of this game. No one's going to buy it. So they went back and changed it up. And I think by, by how late in the release of the N64, they knew they could get away with basically doing anything because then at that point, Nintendo was focusing solely on the GameCube and did not care anymore. So that's why Bad Fur Day came out and is the game that it is. It's a lot more linear. It's not open world like like uh, Banjo Kazooie, where you basically you do one level, go to the next level, and then you're there to the next level. And every level has a theme as well, but every theme is a like movie parody, which I, I enjoy. I love parodies. So if I was going to make any recommendation, and if you're like me and you enjoy a little bit more of a linear linear game, I, I would recommend Conquer's Bad for a Day. Now I know the price is insanely high in that game, so emulate or it's use a rare use replay too. Rare, rare replay. replay. I, I don't I can't recommend the the original Xbox release of Conquer. I can't. I, I own it. It's edited. They blur out more swear words, which is funny because Nintendo's version is no well, you would think Nintendo's version would be more, you know, censored than an Xbox version. But uh, you know, not to throw shades is I had it, I bought it originally because I think they were talking about having a Conquer sequel on the Xbox and it just disappeared. And me wanting to throw my support saying yes, make another Conquer game. I bought it right away. I was just disappointed with it. I, I know it looks better, but to me, I don't like the looks of that Xbox game. I, I prefer, the, I guess, the re reimagination of it on Rare Replay, where he's got more of a polygon look as opposed to the added fur on his face. Mm -hmm. So, if, if anyone's recommendation for me, it's Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Play it any way you can. I really recommend that game as well. Um, so. The the version that's on Rare Replay is that the edited version or is that the? It's, it's the Nintendo sixty four version actually. Oh, it is okay. So it's not it edited. is yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Live and Reloaded is the edited version. Edited version, right? Okay. So. Um, I'd say the go to would probably be Super Mario sixty four. I feel as though that's like a more difficult kind of like three D platform for people who want more of a challenge. Um, an even babier game to try out would be Battle for Bikini Bottom, which is a SpongeBob game. But I speed run that game, and I do Super Mario 64, and you know those are like two of the my favorite platformers. So in like a 3D platformer spectrum, I'd recommend both of those games. In a modern setting, I would not recommend Ukulele <laughs> as a successor, but I feel as though a Hat in Time would be much much better. That's one of my that. personal favorite modern like platformers, in my opinion, and I think everyone needs to go try it if they're a fan of like um, Banjo Kazooie and even like games like Super Mario Sunshine and all anything that falls in that field. I feel as though that that should get more kind of attention than it gets. I'd like to. I mean, uh, one I would, of the uh, one that I played the most oh. when I was younger. So sorry, Chase. Uh, the one I played the most when I was younger was uh, DK64, okay, but good, I think good. that one is that one is a bit of uh, that one's like collectathon times ten. Like there is so much backtracking in that one. So th that one's not for the faint of heart. The one that I do want to recommend, though, uh, just we're gonna kind of break out of the Nintendo rut here, is the Jack and Daxter uh, games. I've only played the first one, but it's the same kind of dynamic of it's what you wanted from banjo kazooie there's voice acting it's the comedy duo of jack and daxter daxter is just like a, a, a smart ass the whole time uh insulting people it's very similar to kazooie uh it's collectathon it's running around everything's got kind of very not i don't want to say very themed levels but they're very distinct levels and like one's a lava level one's a water level one's a 
uh, a beach level, very you know, kind of similar vein of things. So, uh, if you if you like Banjo Kazooie and you want voice acting and humor as well, I would say Jack. Well, Jack and Dexter one for sure. I haven't played two and three, but definitely the first one. Uh, two and three is pretty good too. I was going to say the Spiral series. Me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are good too. Um, because like it, it was one of my like I, I I grew up with those. And then when I when they did the remastered versions, I found they did a beautiful job with it, and I still constantly play them. So, and and for me, I'm I'm gonna just recommend like if you haven't tried Banjo Kazooie, and you have the ability to, I think it's definitely a good one to try. Uh, I did not find it to be as outdated as I feared it would be. It kind of holds up okay even today. Like I said, a, a lot like Super Mario Odyssey. The problem that I have with the collectathon genre is after this, they really started to bloat. You had the, they wanted to give you more, but they made the level so massive and you had to spend so much time in the same game. Tui is, is, is like twice as big in a lot of ways. Every level has 200 notes in Tui. I mean, they doubled everything and then DK 64 and it, it, almost killed me on the genre <laughs> but then coming back and playing this one again now it's it's nice it's compact it's it took me about 15 hours or so in total but any single level you can get through in a half hour to an hour unless you're trying to 100 and then it might take you more time to find everything but i i found this just to be nearly the perfect size for a bite size ish game that you don't have to devote a lot of uh time to all at once unless you you know, need to remember all the quiz answers. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. Um, I do believe that uh, when DK64 came out, it kind of soured my taste on platformers because of how much there is. Like, more yeah. is not always better. Exactly. And, and I did, I 101% of DK64, I do. I will never do that again. I will never want to complete that game again. I might play it because it was fun to play. At least the first 20 hours was fun to play. But yeah. And then just Tui, like just hearing that it's like twice as much and the levels are twice as big. It's just like, you know, I like just getting in a level, getting everything, see how fast I can get it, and then just go to the next one. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna give it another shot to see if my memory serves me correct or not. But uh, probably actually go through Tui and see what it's like now. <laughs> yeah. See if it's well, really I will as play, bad as I'm thinking. I will play Tui, but after hearing about all the difficulties and how they upped everything, I was like, eh, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Do you guys think this could be like, do you think Xbox could actually do something with this franchise? Like to me, I, I know that the master chief is their main mascot and Banjo doesn't, I guess need to be their main mascot, but so I, I always hope they could do like a Mario Odyssey, make it more accessible. Don't make it as challenging as this game. And so I, I guess I'm looking for a Mario Odyssey esque banjo kazooie game a modern one because I, I think it would work i see how he looks on um and don't make him look like nuts and bolts make him look like how he does in smash brothers right now because i think like that model design works perfectly for it so i would love to see like a true banjo 3e not nuts and bolts a true banjo 3e on like next gen consoles from xbox mm -hmm. but i feel as though that that genre is kind of like too niche for people like, or at least in Microsoft's eyes. So they're going to be focusing more on like the shooters, the, I wouldn't say cinematic games. That's more PlayStation stuff. But like, I feel as though that they kind of like think that people are just moved on from that and they want shooters and RPGs and MMOs and all that stuff. Yeah. And we did get the first ukulele um, and it's a lot of the same staff. And I, I got a portion of the way through that game before I kind of gave up on it. Now that I kind of have the taste for collectathons, I might give it another go. But again, it was another Brando. You mentioned it not being your favorite either. I'm not sure why, but it just it was too massive, and I just was I was have it was tedious to collect everything rather than having fun collecting everything. Here on Banjo Kazooie, I had fun pretty much collecting all of it. Uh, some of the challenges maybe weren't fun, but the actual collecting part was fun all the way through the game. I think that's what they were trying to do with nuts and bolts. They realized that everything. Like they didn't want to do another collectathon, right? It was just going to be, it was just going to be the same game again, maybe a little bit bigger. So the same complaints you're having of Tui being too big, just imagine now everything three times as big, right? So I think they were trying to do something different with nuts and bolts, 
unfortunately it just didn't work. I would love, I would love for the, the series to come back. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not sure if we would all have time to do another collectathon type game. So I don't know if they could do something different with it. I like how they tried with a new gimmick, like with the cars, because gim- new gimmicks can work like sunshine with the water nozzle and, and odyssey with the hat with the hat transformations. But it's just like with nuts and bolts, it felt it felt like it'd be good as a separate standalone game, but really, like it's just weird. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't feel like a banjo game at all. I felt like it was a Lego. Like you had to make your own car, like the Lego pieces. You had to make them and then use them to fly. And if your car was like, or your car, your plane was too slow, then you couldn't collect the piece. You couldn't do the level. Exactly. You had to go back out, redo it, and it would be the same process all over again. Yeah. So I think they just need to they just need to workshop it a little bit, get something, find find a new gimmick, and uh, and bring it back. Doesn't mean they like they can't throw back and have some element of collective thought. I mean, I think even nuts and bolts had some elements of that. Um, yeah. But just either either rope it back a little bit, make it make it either almost too similar but then you're you run the risk of everyone saying oh it's just the same game again or going off the rails and doing something completely different i think it's it's gonna have to be one or the other what what are you guys final thoughts on the game guys i think i think it's a great game i think uh, despite what i've said about the boss battle and um the, the quiz game show at the end i think it really is a good game there's a lot of charm there's a lot of humor the controls are are pretty good i would say better than better than average for an n64 game and i think in in those terms i think everyone should at least try it out uh to see if they want to continue it i mean if you're not a, a collectathon person it's not too bad of a collectathon it's not donkey kong 64 if that scares if you've played that and that scared you off this is nothing like that um you don't have to run back to the same level four or five times to get everything there's a little bit of backtracking in one level but i think it's it's pretty doable end game aside board game aside and um and boss level aside i i hope that people will will pick it up and try it if you get to that point and it really turns you off you're not i don't think you're really missing the point of the game the point of the game is everything else that you that you played up to that point yeah, I mean, I'll piggyback everything you just said. The first three, four levels are just joyous to play. Like, if you didn't spend too much on it, and you just play those, and if it gets too tough for you, just stop playing it. I mean, no one's judging you. <laughs> you still had fun playing those first few areas. If you, Ryan will like, judge you. Well, that's one guy. <laughs> Don't tell him. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, I definitely had a good time with it. If you like 3D platformers and want to try some of the older ones per se, see where they came from. I really just, especially the early game, not that it was overwhelmingly easy, but what, what I like is trying to figure things out and they give you all over the place, all over the stages. You're trying to figure out what the game's asking you to do. And they, they signpost it all pretty well um, on how to unlock this jiggy, how to find this one. And it's, you can look at a guide if you need to, but I just had a good time figuring all that stuff out. Some I remembered and some I had to remember or figure out from scratch. So I think it's well worth giving a shot. It's a really good first 3D platformer for anyone who wants to try out the genre. And I'd highly recommend it. But it does get tiresome after the difficulty spike around, say, Rusty Bucket. Uh, That would be my only warning. But if you're a fan of Mario, this is a really good alternative for a good game. I mean, the other games I wouldn't say would be that good for like as a 3D platformer aspect. But Kazooie itself is just, it's fun. It controls well. Um, It's a good entry point to the genre. And it's aged, I should say it's aged okay. But there's also new enhanced versions as the time goes along with the Xbox, like the new releases. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not too sure because I'm not Xbox person anymore, but I'm pretty sure the Series X will later on down the line get an even more enhanced version of the game. Hmm. Most likely. We're hoping. We're hoping. Like I said, besides the bosses at the end, the boss at the end, the game was pretty good for a 3D platformer. Collectibles was pretty fun 
Besides a couple of levels where it got really, really difficult. Besides that, it was something great <laughs> for, for its time. I mean, there's a reason that it's remembered so well. If this That's was right. just a flash in the pan, I don't want to throw like Glover or Rocket or anything under the bus, but uh, it wouldn't be remembered as fondly if there wasn't something to it. And there really is something to it. Don't talk badly about Glover. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, that's the show, everyone. But before we go, I want to thank our guests for, for helping us out here tonight. And um, Josh, why don't you tell us where we can find you on the internet? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thanks for inviting me onto the show. Uh, it's one of my favorite games, and I've always wanted to talk about it with people. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Creepleet. That's Creep1337. Uh, uh, on YouTube, Creep1337. And on Twitch at uh, Creep1337, where I did actually do a full playthrough of this game. So if you want to go back and check that out and get a taste for it, feel free. I apologize for not staying up for that six hour final stream. Uh, <laughs> it was a rough one. So I don't blame nah. you. Brando, where can we find you on the internet? Um, well, you can find me on mostly everything except for Instagram as a uh, moonside Brando. That's moonside from the earthbound series. And then Brando uh, has nothing to do with uh, Dio from Jojo. As what people on Twitter keep asking me. No, it's just my first name without the N at the end. Ah. <laughs> I don't know how people don't make that connection. But um, so people who've known me like way back, I was Mystics or Beastat. Well, now I'm trying to like start fresh again. So I'm trying to get to YouTube and Twitch again, which will also be Moonside Brando. I also kind of run a import video game store, which is opening up again. It's called Retro Velocity, and you can find that on Twitter at Retro Velocity IL, as in Illinois, because Retro Velocity was taken. But that's opening up real soon for the holiday season, so we also have a Facebook group that I will post on that as well uh, later on once everything's good to go. Um, but then YouTube and Twitch, I will mostly be doing speed runs of games, and for YouTubes, I... And wanting to do a series based off of imported Japanese video games where it's like the lesser known ones. So it's not all Pepsi Man or LSD Dream Emulator or Seiken Densetsu 3 or stuff like that. I want to go with the obscure weird ones. But uh, yeah, just follow me at Moonside Brando. I'm a funny guy, I think. That's, th that's my argument. Sure. sure Thanks yeah. for being here. Thanks for no being problem. here. No problem. Chase, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, I want to thank you for letting me come on here. My first podcast on top of that. Um, you can find me on Twitter mm -hmm. at Chase Mad, Ga Chase Mad Gamer. Uh, YouTube, same name, Chase the Mad Gamer. And on Twitch, it's a little bit different. It's Chase and Jess the Mad Gamers. I usually stream and play video games with my girlfriend. And we usually just communicate about everything, talk about everything little bit more vulgar language sometimes uh, than usual, depending on the game and how hard it is. And yeah, that's about it. I'm going to start back streaming and making videos really soon after I get my computer up and running ag again. And that's about it. Thanks for being here. Top, where can we find you on the internet? absolutely um and and again it was really nice to chat with all you guys and thanks for having me on all right so i'm top spot one two three is is my handle if you search that you're going to find everything i do uh the most of what i do is i have a small youtube channel so i put up videos every month there i also most active on twitter as far as socials um i have a twitch channel all that stuff too so anywhere you want to follow me you can but the most active things are my youtube channel and and twitter so thanks for thanks for helping out absolutely thank you ryan where can we find you well thanks for asking josh you can find me on twitter and on instagram with the handle it's rocket sauce uh yeah and that's basically i'm also on the, the discord for the cartridge club so if you want to chat shoot me a message there um but yeah basically that's where you can find me I'd like to reiterate December's Game of the Month will be Life is Strange. If you're playing along or just want to discuss the game with us, make sure you let us know by using the hashtag Cartridge Club on whatever social media platform you frequent. For those of you wanting to get a head start on January's Game of the Month, we'll be playing Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap. 
If you're interested in being a guest on the show, please reach out to us. We are always looking forward to having new community members on to talk about the games they love. Over at the Quick Save Club, they'll be playing Screamer 2 and racing games for December and January. To those of you interested in supporting the club beyond a review on the podcast after your choice, I'd like to mention that the club is entirely funded by pledges made from members of our community. We are extremely grateful to the supporters, and if you're interested in becoming one of them, please look at how you can do so at patreon.com forward slash cartridge club. With that being said, that's the show, everyone. We look forward to hearing from you next month. See you tonight.